Hello everyone, welcome back to Hatsi. I'm Omid Moana joining you from Tehran from this educational platform. And once again, I'm so happy to have this opportunity to share with you all with lots of great colleagues from around the world, great practitioners and educators to share with you the latest topics, the hottest topics in the field of perio, osteo, and dentistry. And I have to say, I was waiting for this day to have one of our great friends, Mark Bouchard from Canada with us. Hello, Mark, and welcome to Hot Seat. Thanks for having me today. And looking forward to sharing some of my journey in this interesting topic and what the latest trends are. I'm sure so many people are excited to hear your presentation as I do. And the topic actually that we're going to talk about today is one of the hottest topics in the field of implant dentistry these days. And over the past two seasons, we had some topics regarding socket shield, partial extraction therapy, and the indications, the complications, the steps. But now we want to go a little bit further and Mark will talk about full arch pathology for all of us. And I think it's very exciting to know the details about the concept and how it works and what are the considerations that we should think about during planning and during the execution. So before we go to the presentation, I would like to have Mark's CV for all of you as a tradition and then we straightly go to the presentation the end, we will have a little discussion on the topic. Dr. Mark Bishar completed his undergraduate studies in medical biophysics at the University of Western Ontario and was a gold medal recipient as top graduate of his program. He went on to complete his Doctor of Dental Surgery degree at Schulich, I don't know if I spell it right, pronounce it right, Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry since graduating, he practiced in the Durham region with a focus on digital workflow, digital implantology, dental implants, bone grafting, material regeneration, and tissue regeneration. He currently collaborates with members of the Myron Lab in the United States on tissue regeneration, utilizing PRF, and he's He's a published author on PRF, immediate dental implants, and clinical applications. He's the president and founder of the Canadian Implant Dentistry Network, Canada's largest dental implant community with over 13,000 members focused on advancing implantology and implant dentistry. So I'm so happy to have Mark, and for all of you watching Hot Seat right now, I completely recommend you all to join this Facebook page. It's full of amazing stuff, clinical um, literature, clinical photographies, and so many great cases will be shared by great practitioners from around the world. Also, you can follow his page on Instagram and I will shorten my speech and Mark, we are ready for your beautiful presentation and at the end we will have a fun discussion on the topic. Thanks for having me. So let's just uh, jump right into the presentation now. And I'm gonna start the presentation today for those who are not familiar with the socket shield technique, kind of an overview of the steps that we typically will take in the procedure. And then I'll go over four cases today to using partial extraction, not using partial extraction. And I'll discuss in each of those cases why I chose the approach of going with conventional bone reduction versus partial extraction therapy techniques. So let me share my screen with everybody.
So the topic today is full arch digital pet petology. So why digital? Uh, the reason being is over the last year we have brought in into our practices a full lab in-house. So we started to look at ways to improve the workflow with our patients and we're able now to deliver from temporization to final the work that we deliver to our patients all in-house. And part of understanding the steps along the way allows us to do this without having to outsource many of the steps to our patients. And patients have really found that to be nice, especially for these cases where, um, you know, sometimes many people deal with, with the, each step and sometimes you get issues with the laboratory in communication. So a little bit about myself, I uh, graduated in 2010, so in my ninth year of practice, I started the Canadian Implant Dentistry Network uh, approximately three years ago and it has grown tremendously with over 13,000 members online. And as well, we are a branch of the IDDA, which is the International Digital Dental Academy in Canada. And um, it, I'd highly recommend to check out our Facebook page and follow some of the cases and trends and cases that are, are upcoming in implantology. So first, I always say find your passion, but to do so you need to have a good support system or you, without my wife who's a dentist also, none of this will be possible because she allows me the hours that I need to commit to this also. So she understands the time commitment to get something like this involved uh, with. And these are my two kids, Jason and Emily. And uh, you know, they're a great uh, number of supporters in what I do. As well, we run a, uh, run a number of study club, hands-on education in person, not just live as well. And uh, we have courses from uh, you know, practitioners such as more Salama, we've had Frank Zastro come and educate our local colleagues in September of last year. Here's uh, Michael Scherer and I at our All on X course last year. Unfortunately, with COVID this year, a lot of the education had to be postponed for the remainder of the year, but we moved a lot of it online and uh, we try and uh, move forward from there. So let's jump right into the concept of partial extraction therapy and we'll go over a few definitions in case some of you may not be familiar with the concept. So partial extraction therapy encompasses three terms which is the socket shield technique, root submergence technique and the pontic shield. So it started first by the Herstler group in 2010, dates back as well to the Mitzius group in 2006 and we know that if you take out the total tooth completely, you're going to get some level of bone loss. And this is especially true when you look at the buckle plate and by uh, you know, the works of Arugio and Linde, and they've shown that in most cases, the buckle plate is between a millimeter thick in some cases. So you will get eventual collapse of that cortical plate, especially in the anterior zone. So what is the socket shield technique? Instead of removing the entire tooth, we remove a partial segment of the tooth and we basically place the implant paddle to the shield and the implant can be in contact or not with the remain, remainder part of the root. And the results that I've achieved with this technique have simply been fantastic. And I'll go over the principles before we jump into the application in full arch. So my personal oldest socket shield, this was actually my first case that I had uh, performed. I have now five and a half year result on it. And for me, when I look at cases that have adjacent implants, or if you have an existing implant, now you're losing the tooth next to it. This is a, a critical area where you may want to apply this technique because you can see we're able to preserve bone peaks between adjacent implants, but also between an natural tooth and an implant, you do preserve that bone peak as well. So why is the technique used? In the short term, when you extract the tooth, the PDL comes with it. So this ligament is made of fibers, blood vessels that feed into the dense bone that forms the buccal cortical plate. 
So we know that the blood supply to the periodontium is now more important than the blood supply supplied by the periosteum. So why is the technique used at all? In the medium term, you'll see some cases where the implant looks like it's been completely placed at the bony housing and you wonder why that happened. Is it because the oral surgeon or the dentist or the periodontist placing the implant placed it incorrectly or what really happened in the case? And as a consequence, what are some of the consequences? You can get gingival retraction, you can get shine through or the gray color of the implant coming through. You can get also potential future peri-implantitis due to these concerns of exposure of your implant. So you can get tissue retraction that occurs, you can get pigmentation, depression of the soft tissue, and what about in full arch? So here's a case where you had an implant placed and a number of years later, you continue to have bone loss around the implant. And what do you do? You resort to soft tissue techniques to mask the problems that you started in the first place by removing the tooth entirely. So in this case, a free gingival graft was used in order to allow for correction of the deficiency. And basically, this continues onward and onward. So why do we use this technique at all? You can see that these implants here don't have any bone at all placed in the buckle. It looks like these implants were placed incorrectly. But what really happened was these implants were placed as immediate implants. And they were placed on the same day the teeth were removed. So over time, you have function, you have muscle pull, and you end up with bone resorption. So why do we use the technique? We maintain the periodontium, and that maintains the vascularity of the keratinized gingiva as well. So when we take out a tooth entirely, we lose the alveolar or bone, but we also lose the vascularity that the periodontium provides to the gingival margin. What do we do normally as alternatives? Normally in a type one socket, which is a socket that has an intact buccal wall, we're placing the implant, filling the gap with a biomaterial of choice and compensating by adding a connective tissue graft. That could be from the tuberosity or the palate. First, there's a learning curve to doing so. And in addition to that, you need to have the clinical skills in order to do so. So what can we do as an alternative? We need to preserve that buccal plate. And we know that the buccal plate from analysis in 87% of cases, for example, in the, in the work uh, that I'm showing here, had buccal wall thicknesses of approximately one millimeter or less. So if you take out the tooth, even if you are not raising any flaps, you will end up with total buccal bone collapse over the many years to come. So let's go over some of the steps quickly over the technique and in its application next to full arch. So so the technique involves first a horizontal cut to remove the crown. And you're going to do this with a diamond bird high speed, and you're going to cut above the tissue so that you don't damage it. There are a number of great kits that are out in the market now, such as the, as, such as the pet kit from Brassler. I know Megagen has a kit that's uh, released. Uh, kits are great, but it's also important to understand the principles as to why you're applying each step. So kids can help, but you need to understand the principles still. Next, you're doing the horizontal cut. So why do we do the horizontal cut? The horizontal cut by removing the crown allows you visual access in order to make the vertical cuts next. Next, you're going to be doing that vertical sectioning of the tooth in a mesiodistal direction. And this is the critical step in this technique. The vertical cut, is done using a long shank round and diamond burr at high speed. And you're going to begin from the center of the pulp chamber towards the mesial and distal sides. It's important to make this cut in a controlled manner so you don't damage the papilla or the adjacent interproximal bone. So you can see here, we're making the cut in a full arch case in a very controlled manner. And we'll go over some of the principles in this case later on. With the vertical cut, the clinician should not be looking directly at the tooth in case it's rotated. So you want 
a good overview of the tooth you're working on. Ensure that cut is parallel to the buckle plate and not exactly following the mesiodistal anatomy looking at the tooth. So begin again with the same long shank and diamond burr and then continue with the bone cutter burr. If you're starting out, actually premolars can be some of the easier teeth to cut. So and, uh, the reason being is uh, an upper premolar has buccal roots separated from the palatal roots. Again, you'll use a long shank crown diamond burr this cut. This is a tip, although I don't use it personally, you can use as well um, endo file and do a measurement of the tooth length if you're unsure. I would highly recommend in all these cases to get CBCT analysis to determine the, the root shape in relation to your, your bone because the root trajectory off a periapical x-ray cannot be told. So you need to have CBCT analysis done for every one of these cases. If you're planning to do it this way, you can use the endophile marking to transfer the marking into the length of the burr before you go to full depth. So again, you'll begin with a superficial cut going to full depth till you reach the apex. And a quick illustration from uh, my dear friend, Jorge Campos, showing the principles. After the cut is performed, you'll begin to remove the paddle segment. And you can use things like a periotome to section the PDL fibers and a thin straight elevator is used to luxate or remove that paddle fragment. You can see here in a full arch case, I'm delivering the paddle fragment. And uh, you want to ensure that you do not apply any pressure on the buckle shield or the buckle aspect because you do not want to luxate the shield preparation you've done accidentally. If the buckle loosens at all, or you notice that you have a potential crack or fracture in the shield, you should avoid continuing with the shield procedure and continue as you normally would uh, by removing the shield and continue with a GBR procedure and placement of your implant. Once the roots are cut, it's useful to measure so that you know the implant length. Again, for me, because we have a full digital lab, we are doing all this at time uh, by making guides often that we can place our implants through the guide. And we'll go over that in the cases that we show. Uh, if you're not doing a guide or anything of that nature, having the root uh, inspected once you're removing it can give you some visual clues about the implant length that you're placing. So make sure that you've removed all remnants of the gutta percha, remove the apex to no pathology is present. If you have a really long tooth, some tips that I've used in the past include doing basically an apisectomy access to ensure that you've removed the apex of the tooth. Here's an upper premolar being removed. And it's important to prepare the bevel, which is the, one of the most important aspects of treatment. And next, we get a lot of questions asking at what level this uh, socket shield edge should be left at. So there are three situations. Basically, you can leave uh, the bevel below the gingival sulcus, but still supracrestal. You can leave it at the crestal level, or you can place it subcrestal. So when do you do uh, level one, two, or three, and when should you do it? So if you leave it at below the tissue, your shield below the tissue, but it's supracrestal, it's been shown that leaving it above can also help maintain the attachment of the epithelial attachment in place. And these fibers help the, to maintain the gingival architecture. You need to ensure that you protect the tissue if you're leaving it uh, such that the shield is above the bone level. So you need to use an instrument such as uh, the one I'm showing. And I know the Brassler Pet Kate uh, has a nice protective instrument as well that you can use to protect the area to ensure that you do not damage the gingival tissue. Again, you'll be using uh, a number of instruments like a fur or a round diamond to bevel and reduce your shield. 
The consensus from the first PET meeting in 2017 is that you should maintain the shield at level two, basically reduce the shield down to bone level. And a uh, technique employed and proposed by Dr. Salama is a mini flap technique, which is what I use personally. And the reason is that you will have less likelihood of internal shield exposures by reducing the shield down to bone level. So you'll be using a very uh, small flap and you'll be basically trimming the shield down to bone level in this situation. So I find with this uh, approach, you're more likely to have soft tissue completely covering the shield without any internal shield exposures. How about subcrestal level? So this is not relevant to us at all. So I don't recommend to take your shield and try and have it below the bone because you can damage the buccal bone. And for us as clinicians, we're trying to preserve the buccal bone. There's no reason to take the shield and then bury it below the bubble. So it's not recommended to try this approach. And this is a very nice case, which I finished a year ago. And this is where I find that PET really shines. I had a case of an old external hex Brandemark implant, which was placed 15 years ago. And then I had a patient who had internal resorption of the tooth next to it. You can see the buccal bone collapse from the old external hex Brandemark implant to the new placed implant. So I gave the patient the choice of removal of the old implant and reconstruction of the area or going with a partial extraction therapy approach and Maintain, maintaining the old implant, you can see there's a substantial buccal bone loss over a number of years, despite the lingual placement of that implant. So again, when I see adjacent implants, I always think, think of partial extraction therapy because this is the only way to maintain the papilla. You can see the papilla even on our scan body impression has been maintained between the old implant and the new implant. We jump now to prosthetic space. So again, you need to make sure the internal part of your shield is shaped or beveled in the first three or four millimeters so that you have adequate tissue covering the, um, the shield and also giving space for the abutment. So sometimes I see people performing this procedure and you, they don't make a custom healing abutment and they send it to the laboratory and the lab has to completely guess as to the crown shape. And uh, if accidentally the crown is over contoured, you can apply excessive pressure causing shield loosening or movement. So you need to ensure that you design the case in such a way to allow adequate space for your prosthetic abutment. So it should look something like this. So again, this is a case I'm finishing up. Make sure that you've beveled the internal part of your uh, preparation in order to allow space for your abutment. So I use uh, in my office the cervical healing abutment system, and that helps us, especially for single teeth, to ensure that I've designed it and I can visually see it's not against the shield. That way, when we, our technician duplicates it for the crown, he is going to copy a profile and we have no pressure accidentally against the shield. So like I mentioned, we are going to keep the shield at bone level on Moses. And for implant position, you're going to be typically one to two millimeters below the shield. And uh, typically I try not to have any contact with the shield because I don't want accidental uh, movement of the shield during placement or in function. But in some cases, uh, buckle to legal spacing, you will be very close to the shield just because of the, the root space. You may not have that adequate room to have such a big gap space. So like I mentioned, the implant can be separated or remain in contact with the shield. And, but it really depends on the tooth that's being replaced, how much buckle to lingual buccal to lingual space you will have.
Okay, and we've discussed this again, leaving space for emergence profile so that we have adequate space for the prosthetics, for the prosthesis, allowing space for the tissue formation and coverage of the shield. Again, this is a nice case illustrating that without the shield uh, being present, you will have collapse even on molar sites. So you can apply this technique even on molars, even though it is is a bit complex. Root canal content again needs to be always removed. Ensure that you removed all pathology like I've mentioned. Again if you cannot access the apex, if the tooth is really long like an upper canine, you can uh, perform an apicectomy procedure to remove the contents at the apex. So some shield criteria before we jump into our full arch digital pet cases. So you want to have a shield that's as wide as mesodistal as possible. This ensures that there's no potential movement of the shield. You've removed all the root canal content, no gutta perca, no apex preferably, internal bevel of the shield to allow room for the prosthesis abutment. And again, if your shield is loose or you've noticed any luxation, you, you should remove it and go to traditional implant placement with GBR procedure, if need be. So let's go over some cases. And uh, I'll go over why I started to look into this, especially for full arch. You know, I see the trend, especially in full arch, you see so many FP3 prostheses being performed on patients when it may not be necessary. And FP3 is basically a prosthesis that's replacing the crown but also the pink architecture of the patient. Often it's done in cases where patients are um, either have lost teeth for many years or they have a history of periodontal disease and have lost bone with it. But in some cases, these patients have their teeth and we go and do bone reduction either way because we don't know better maybe or it's faster. So in some cases, let's look at alternatives and what we can do for our patients to restore them back to their natural smile. So full arch and PET. So in most cases involving full arch treatment, the patient either has, uh, for like I mentioned, mentioned extensive bone loss, and in some cases, uh, bone reduction may be necessary. So if you look at these two cases, my top patient here, has a very nice smile. It's, she does not have a gummy smile. Should we go and reduce bone similar to the bottom uh, picture case where that person has excessive uh, display of her, uh, her gingival tissue? So these two cases, I think you should be approaching them in the same way. And if we look at Mallow's criteria for success, he has a list that he lists, and one of them uh, being the smile line in that transition zone. And that's a key element of why we do some of that bone reduction. But not all cases end up needing bone reduction in order to mask or hide the transition zone. So this is what we want to avoid. You know, if you have a case like this where bone reduction was not performed, you'll end up with uh, aesthetic failure of your case. So in some cases, putting partial extraction therapy aside, you do need to perform bone reduction in order to hide the transition zone. Let's go through why bone reduction is necessary. In this case, this patient of mine came in. She's a gummy smile patient. She has a history of decay on, on all present teeth, and she's looking at an implant solution. So in this case, we can say that even though we want to perform partial extraction, therapy, it may not be the best solution because after I've done bone reduction, the roots that are remaining may be too short in order to keep them. So if we cannot have roots that are stable and we need to perform a lot of bone reduction, the partial extraction therapy technique may not be the option. So this is my patient and how she presented. The upper anterior bridge had decay underneath it and was going to fail, and she was fed up of fixing the remaining teeth. So 
In this case, I used something called the Chrome Guide, which was um, a guide system introduced in the USA and Canada. And we have what we call a base plate. And this base plate stays on during the entire surgery, meaning our bone reduction, our osteotomy, and teeth, temporary PMMA teeth are attached to this base plate as a reference. So we are not worried about canting or shifting of our prosthesis with positioning at the end, which can happen at times if you're uh, doing your pickup and it's soft tissue supported only. So sometimes your, your midline can be off or your prosthesis can be uh, canted. So this is all done and planned ahead of time digitally. So we go ahead and uh, start our bone reduction. In this case, I used uh, my piezo unit to do the bone reduction. So we do the bone reduction. Next, we are replacing our osteotomy guide. The nice thing about this system is that it has an open guide concept. You can see uh, where the black markings are. That's basically telling you to align your implant with that position in order to allow the timing of your multi-units to be in the correct position for multi-units that are not straight. So if you have uh, 17 or 30 degree multi-units, for example, with the, the neodent system or whichever system you use, you're going to line up the trajectory uh, to that alignment of your osteotomy guide. So then this guide is available for all implant systems as well. So it's not uh, one implant specific. We place our implants and close the area. We uh, tend to carry the, a lot of that thick paddle tissue over to the buckle to plump up the keratinized tissue in these cases. And you'll see at the end, we have uh, a very nice uh, result. And then we proceed with the same thing on her bottom arch, again, with the placement of our base guide. And this is how the patient leaves. And in uh, first week, we have her come in, recheck the occlusion. And this is the result at three months. So we've removed the temporaries, checked the his tissue healing. We have very nice main maintenance of the keratinized tissue around all implants. In the upper here, you'll notice I had a one back implant uh, that's a bit different, the color of the multi-unit. So the torque was actually quite low with one implant system. I had to go to a wide implant in order to get enough torque to load the case. So the back implants tend to be your uh, basically decision makers if you're going to load those cases or not. So by ensuring that you achieve the proper torque, ISQ levels on those implants, we're able to load the case. And this is the final. So these are uh, full arch monolithic zirconia prostheses. And in this case, we did not perform partial extraction therapy. But the reason I show you this case is I'll contrast it into a case where we can apply partial extraction therapy in full arch. And this is the result. And you can see even after we've done bone reduction on the patient, in order to give her a prosthesis that is aesthetic and uh, basically replacing the gingival architecture, we had to do the bone reduction. So even with bone reduction, you can see this patient still needed pink in order to replace the top portion of the prosthesis. So in this case, if you look at it, it's not a partial extraction therapy consideration case. Let's look at another one where it's done now using a different system. So because we are, have a, our own digital lab in office, we're able to now print our own guide for full arch. So this one is uh, done using a Stroman Smile in a Box solution and if you have the ability to print your own guides, you can take the entire process and the co-diagnostic software and mill 
and print the guides yourself. So we started to do that in our cases most recently. You can see in this case with the interior uh, mandible, the undercut there is so severe that if you wanted to consider partial extraction therapy, the case would be very difficult to maintain the teeth despite us wanting to. So you can see after the bone uh, or the flap is elevated, that a lot of these teeth here, first they had a uh, very large dehiscences. And even after uh, removal of the teeth, this is the amount of bone reduction we have to perform in order to get past the undercut. So unless you're going to do, perform extensive vertical and horizontal uh, GBR cases, the only solution in these cases is unfortunately teeth removal. So again, the reason I show you two cases without partial extraction therapy is that you have to understand not every case will fit that criteria. Sometimes we have no choice due to anatomy to remove the teeth, unfortunately. So we go ahead and perform our bone reduction. Placement of our osteotomy guide. Again, keep in mind these are printed in-house. In so we've now... Uh, are able to reduce the cost of these cases substantially because the resin cost is much lower by printing it in office. Placement of our implants, placement of our multi-units. And the interesting thing about this case is the multi-units are actually tipping the entire implant prosthesis trajectory to the facial. So because of the amount of bone reduction we had to do, our prosthesis would be too lingual without redirecting the multi-units facially. So this is all designed and planned ahead of time digitally. So we know each of these 17 degree multi-units ahead of time need to be in this position. We're not guessing on the day of where the positioning is going to be. We've planned it ahead of time in such a way that in the correct position. So we do our pickup of our temporary prosthesis. And you can see we're lingual, and this is where we want to be on the prosthesis. But to do that, we had to tip the multi-units facially, which is typically you don't have to do that. But in cases of severe undercuts, you would have had to plan this ahead of time. So let's jump in here to our third case. And this is done with what we call the Chrome Guide natural system. And this was the first case ever performed in Canada. And I was uh, very uh, happy to be involved with it. And with this patient here, we actually elected to perform partial extraction therapy along with the implant plan. Placement. So we actually ended up performing partial extraction therapy for his centrals and canines and placement of eight implants on the upper for an FP1 or crown and bridge style prosthesis. So you can see here I've begun to uh, shape the, the shields, reduce the shields, any sharp areas. You can see here, I'm starting to begin preparation to, to remove the lingual aspect. So canines tend to be some of the more difficult teeth to perform this procedure on, but when it's done, you will see the pictures. The results are simply outstanding in terms of maintenance of the canine shape, the canine eminence. I personally have not used uh, kits. I know there are a number of great kits out there, but you can choose to use a kit or not. But I use uh, not very many burrs to personally to perform this procedure, maybe two or three uh, burrs. So our, after our shield preparations are performed, we're going to do the implant placement or osteotomies all digitally planned ahead of time. 
this case, this case here, I actually uh, did the preparations without raising a flap and uh, very mini mini flap. The the last case I will be showing as well will be performed using a full flap, and I found that full arch this tends to be a lot easier. So let's go through some of the pictures and elements of this case next. So this was the patient, how he presented. And in most cases, if this patient walked into a practice today, he probably would end up with full arch bone reduction and placement of an FP3 prosthesis. I would get in 95% of the time, this is how the patient will be treated. And for me, I felt like a case like this where someone does not have periodontal bone loss. He has solid teeth with uh, you know root decay this is a perfect case for partial extraction therapy consideration so you can see here he's got a number of teeth with uh, root decay so we begin again with our positioning base guide for the chrome guide system it's pinned into position for the duration of the procedure We go ahead and begin our partial extraction therapy technique on the, I kept the canines and centrals in this case. Our osteotomy guide is placed. Pickup of our temporary. This is a metal reinforced temporary because you know when you go to an FP1 style prosthesis, the prosthesis tends to be thinner as well, so you don't want to have it uh, break during healing or affect the, temp the implants. We pick up our prosthesis, seal the access holes so that you don't get any material in the screw channels. We then take this upstairs to our lab. <clears throat> we use our desktop scanner to digitize the model. close the case, and patient walks out with uh, the temporary. So this is patient on first week. Usually the occlusion is quite good when we plan these cases digitally. And while he's healing, we move on to his lower arch. So during healing, we go on to his lower arch. We place four implants, single unit teeth at the back crowns on the front. And, uh, you know, I gave the, the person a chance to recover. We uh, elected to keep his dentition because on the bottom, you know, not every case needs to have uh, teeth removed unnecessarily. Here is the healing image. At three months of the upper, there's a very small internal shield exposure on uh, one of the canine sites. This is manageable simply by trimming the exposure down. And this can happen because of excessive pressure from the temporary prosthesis. And it's a very manageable, manageable complication of the, of the socket shield technique. So if you ever have that uh, um, happen, it can be easily managed with trimming the exposure down and making sure your temporary is not applying excessive pressure. So you can see the canine uh, buckle bone. It's been entirely maintained here by performing this procedure. We start to, to shape the tissue towards the final. We mark a few areas where I want to apply pressure changes with our laboratory. Then we go into the three shape or exocat software design of our phase to apply those pressure changes in the software and you can see this case we placed it on multi-unit abutment so i'm not going straight to fix on eight implants uh, i think this would be very difficult to achieve true passive prosthesis so on a full arch i would recommend work at the multi-unit level always because this allows uh, a bit of leeway in the prosthesis in terms of uh, ensure, ensuring it's passive. So this is full monolithic zirconia again on eight implants. 
and this is on insert. So we've managed to close the diastema on the patient. This is on insert. And because we've planned the case fully digitally, we've taken the time to design it properly. Our insert is uh, very predictable at this point. And you know, the patient loves it because look, uh, we didn't have to go and reduce his jawbone unnecessarily in this case. Imagine he had a very bulky FP3 prosthesis instead. I think he would have uh, felt a huge difference in, in this situation. And my last case, which is I'm finishing uh, very soon, I wanted to try elements of this, but have a bit of a different approach to it. So this is that case I showed from the very first uh, discussion on uh, when we should approach bone reduction versus not. This lovely lady had a history uh, of actually very good crown and bridge done only a number of years ago, but because of medications she's on, she had a decay underneath every single one of these. So if you look at the x-rays, she has a very large decay underneath a lot of the crown and bridge. So in this case, again, when I see a very solid, healthy bone, solid teeth, partial extraction therapy jumps out at me as the first approach I would, I would take. In this case, we actually printed in our uh, office uh, palatal supported temporary to be picked up intraorally. So the last one we had done it using the Chrome system. We wanted to see if we can design the elements in office now. So we had the implant positions pre and digitally. We had a guide made as well, and we're going to pick up the positions of the implants in the mouth. So we go ahead and perform partial extraction therapy. In this case, we utilize a number of techniques here, including uh, partial extraction therapy. We performed um, also root submergence technique on the lateral sites. Here we're removing an old post from the tooth. We go ahead and remove the paddle segment. So we have a number of things happening. We have uh, partial extraction socket shields on the centrals and canines. And what I've done is actually kept the laterals until the end, including some of the premolars at the back because I'm using them as a tooth supported guide. So the guide that I've made is actually being supported on these for osteotomies. Then I'm going ahead and I'm performing my uh, root submergence technique. So you can see by the end, we've performed here root submergence on the laterals. We've performed socket shields on centrals and canines and performed uh, root submergence on first premolar sites. So we basically managed to keep a lot of the architecture. In this case, uh, I've contrasted my technique by raising a full flap. I found if you're gonna do a full arch using this uh, partial extraction, modality, it's actually easier to raise a full flap than having to work uh, without a flap. And you're also going to minimize potential shield exposure this way. Placement of our multi-units, again, uh, I think it's, it's a must to be working at multi-unit level in these cases, especially on conical connection implants. Attachment of our cylinders for pickup. And tissue closure. So I'll have a healing uh, update of this in the next month or two. Um, and when I do, you can find it on our forum online. But I think here we're going to get a tremendous result with this case, and it's going to be very natural when we're finished. So, what are some conclusions we can uh, draw from the, these kinds of cases? Not all cases should be treated with a P3 bone reduction approach. So what I call a cookie cutter approach to full arch is not the best thing for our patients. So we need to look at the age of the patient and looking at 
approaches like partial extraction therapy and digital dentistry that can improve the outcome for your patients. And, and uh, I would recommend comprehensive training, including hands-on for these kinds of cases in order to improve the quality of the work that we can deliver to our patients. Thank you so much, Mark. I truly enjoyed the presentation and you really went to the depth of the detail of partial extraction therapy. And first of all, again, thank you for presenting these beautiful cases. And I will have a little discussion on the topic because I have some questions regarding uh, your beautiful presentation. One of them was uh, regarding the mini flap uh, approach by Maurice Salama, as you mentioned. I want to know the details about it. I mean, not the details, but you presented it. It was in the lower table, if I'm right, uh, like to canine in the first premolar or the lateral incisor in the canine. And I want to know your approach. You prefer to elevate the papilla or you go from the base of the papilla and, re I mean, reflect the flap. I want to know your approach regarding the case because as I noticed in your case, one of the papillas was, was, was saved, one of the papillas was uh, reflected. So I want to know, is there any uh, preference or the basic of the concept is just only minimally reflect the flap and expose the arbolar crest? I think it depends on the, which zone of the mouth you're in. I mean, if it's in a highly aesthetic zone and you want to go with a papilla sparing flap, you can consider that. I mean, in as long, long as you have visual as, access to see the shield relationship to the bone, then you don't have to have a full uh, thickness of flap reflection mm -hmm. with the papilla. You can spare the papilla. Uh, but I think it's important that you get a good instrument that, can, uh, that you can place against uh, the bone duration is reduced enough. That's the key element. Uh, but whether you choose to include the papilla or not, I think it depends on the zone of the mouth. You may have a sparing flap in the anterior maxilla, for example, but if it's a low, uh, you know, low aesthetic zone, like lower premolar, it's okay, I think, to raise the flap uh, in this area, including the papilla. And, and speaking of speaking of flap, because in your large cases you mentioned uh, that it's easier to reflect the flap to see to get to see exactly the relation of the shield and the buccal crest and the amount of reduction. So if you want to speak about the anterior aesthetic zone, in those cases, do you also prefer to reflect the flap to see the relation of the uh, shield and the crest of the bone? or you see any significant difference in amount of resorption of the buccal bone by reflecting or not reflecting the flap? If it's if a it's single tooth site in anterior zone, I don't raise flap. But mm -hmm. if it's a full arch case, in order to get that uh, scalloping of the shields and the bone, it's easier for me to raise the flap. I, I likely will get a little bit of bone die back. I will lose some papilla. But you know, even when we finish the case where I didn't re raise the flaps, it ends up in a elongated crown form that we have to do because we're gonna lose some of the papilla either way in these cases. So if I'm going to lose some of the papilla and I have adequate visualization I think for full arch, it's to, to raise that flap. Mm -hmm. For single tooth sites, though, I don't raise a, a flap. I, I will stick to any flap approach uh, and often not even uh, flap at all, just as long as I can protect the tissue. Um, you know, sometimes I don't flap at all. Yeah, I agree. And, and Mark, you, you, you presented a beautiful case on the two central incisors. One of them that you mentioned, I think it was number nine, that you mentioned was for about 15 years ago. And the number eight was the partial extraction therapy case. And you showed the beautifully the collapse between those, these two teeth. So as I noticed, I think it was a tick biotype patient. So I think, I don't know, I wanna know the details about the case because I'm very curious about that. 
in the case of tooth number nine that you faced that much of collapse, that amount of collapse, did you place graph material into the gap like a dual zone concept 15 years ago at the time of placement? And do you think that because, you know, every year we have some changes, some new ideas. And do you think that, I mean, let's say, put it this way. Can we say that all the time we will get better outcome with partial extraction therapy comparing to dual zone socket management, especially if it's a thick biotype patient? Can we say that it happens in all the cases or by any chance we have differences by some uh, different patients. Yeah. yeah. I mean, first the case, uh, you know, I, I was not the original uh, cl clinician that placed the implant. So he had a place uh, 15 years ago elsewhere. So I can't tell why the implant was placed very lingual or if there was already potential bone loss in the buckle. But either way, with placement, we can see the concavity that's developed. So I don't know if there was biomaterial use or augmentation done. At so I, you know, I wish I had an original image to compare it to now, which would be interesting to see. But you know, this is a very thick biotype patient, and we can get away in a lot of these cases, uh, you know, with thin bone the cases are still very successful but what about these thin biotype case patients and patients where we have to change biotype and morphine if we look at our alternatives like partial extraction therapy these are very minimally invasive approaches in these cases without having to resort to connective tissue grafts and uh, augmentation techniques to uh, mask what's so I think, you know, case basis, I mean, it's very, uh, if you look at dual zone versus partial extraction therapy, uh, you know, I think the amount of work that goes into dual zone versus partial extraction therapy, I think partial extraction therapy will still have a better outcome, especially in these thin biotype patients. Thin biotype patients. Yeah, that was the point. So usually I think the main preference for partial extraction therapy is thin biotype patients because usually the risk of the collapse and risk of the tissue changes in time is more. And uh, regarding your full arch cases, uh, as you know, we have also the scallop guide concept. So what's your experience with that to make it a combination with, with this approach, the scalloping and doing the, using the scallop guide? Yeah, I mean, the case that I showed, the first one actually came with a scallop guide and, uh, you know, it was a, basically the case or the pro, it was a prototype of this uh, Chrome natural procedure in development. So there were still kind of uh, bugs and, and, and things in development that we worked out uh, on that case. So there's been a number of changes in the design of this concept of this particular systems guide that we gave back as feedback to the company manufacturing it. I think it's a good idea to have that scallop guide, but uh, you know, things designed on a model sometimes don't translate a hundred percent to what we see in the mouth. So, you know, a technician designing something and uh, seeing it on a model in the mouth, you have to sometimes uh, design it or make changes to implant trajectory uh, tissue shape uh, on the fly. So I think it's useful to have, uh, but you know, I still think you, need, you should be able to understand the outcome uh, and design it yourself. So I, uh, it's not to say that these guides uh, don't have it. I actually did have it. I just chose not to use it on that particular case. Yeah, yeah. And, and Mark, uh, actually I'm enjoying talking with you, but as a final question, I want to know, you, you, you presented a, a couple of indications for partial extraction therapy in the socket shield specifically. And in one of the items you mentioned, remove the apex preferably. 
and that's one of the things that I always think about in my cases. And we we need to remove the apex. But what if we don't? What if we don't remove the apex with the palatal section and just drill through the apex? Because you mentioned preferably that that was a thing that I wanted to ask you. And do you have any experience leaving the apex? I mean, not being able to bring it out with the palatal section but drilling through the roots and eliminating the presence of the apex there. What's your, what's your um, idea about it? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I miss on my, um, some of my early cases in removing the paddle segment, I've missed the apex. So I use a very thin long diamond burr to try and go in and then tease it out, uh, almost doing like a crown preparation on that little root fragment and pick it out. And if I can't access it though, I will make a, uh, you know, aesthetic buckle access flap to try and remove it through the uh, buckle window. So you can choose to drill it out, but you know, I'm afraid sometimes too, if you uh, drill it out, you have loose fragments of the root against the implant. So I prefer to at least visually see it all out. Sometimes these teeth also have apical pathology that you want to uh, ensure is completely removed and you've debrided the area. So, uh, you know, if there's no pathology, it's a different story. But, you know, for me, I, I don't want to risk it with these cases. Yeah. So you prefer to remove the apex all the time, whether there is a pathology there or no? I, I still prefer to because, I mean, I don't want to question myself later or think about it, right? I want to sleep well. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Thank you so much, Mark. I have to say uh, it was a pleasure for me joining you today in this platform, and I really enjoyed the presentation and the discussion with you, my friend, and really hope to see you very soon. I'm pretty sure all the audience have enjoyed your presentation, and thank you again for accepting. Thanks for having me and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch soon. Sure, my friend. Stay safe and take care.